Hey everybody, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. I am here today with Craig Beckman. He is the CEO of Aqua Membranes, and we're going to be talking about membrane technology, its evolution over time, and some of the advancements that they're trying to push forward. So Craig, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you coming on the call. Yeah, thanks for the time. Now, I had intended to actually interview you at the uh, AMTA, AWWA, Memory Technology Conference. Unfortunately, I couldn't go, but um, I wanted to talk to you just briefly about that, about how that show was, what were some of the things that you saw that were interesting from a uh, trends perspective in the memory technology space? Sure. Yeah, it was a great show. Good to get together with the industry again. And I would say the most um, common thing we saw was new technology. And that comes from new membrane types. Uh, we were right next to a membrane booth called NAL Membrane. They're working on a chlorine tolerant membrane early stages. Uh, lots of buzz around graphene uh, in the membrane industry, like lots of industries. We keep hearing the term of when is graphene membrane going to work? When is graphene membrane going to work? Um, and so there was you know, a group there displaying that. So we got lots of questions there because somewhat analogous to what we were doing, trying to increase the throughput uh, improve efficiencies in the membrane technology. So lots of people in our booth thinking, oh, well, what are you guys doing to that? Could you do that? The same thing, et cetera. So I think that was a big theme. And then besides that, on maybe the more bigger established companies, we're seeing more and more push for reuse and being able to do reuse in kind of creative ways. You know, for a long time, the membrane industry has been pretty set on the membrane manufacturers, put out design recommendations, most equipment makers, users follow that. And now that playbook's kind of been thrown out. Uh, we see a lot of companies like Desalitec and Rotec and even IDE now with their pulse flow with this idea of, all right, we're gonna take the membrane process, run it very differently than everybody's run it in the past in order to have much higher recoveries or to reclaim a solid that maybe in the past was very difficult. So I love that. that the industry is pushing the boundaries on what we can do and what we can't do, really with that focus of reclaiming solids that might have a value as a secondary market to lower the total cost and really focusing in on recoveries or efficiencies, meaning right, if we start with 100,000 gallons of wastewater, how do we squeeze it all the way down and reclaim you know, 95% of it or even 96 or 98% of it, which when I started in the industry 30 years ago was like unheard of. Um, so it's exciting <laughs> to see those applications. Yeah, well, I, that was one of the questions that I had was about like this evolution over time. It is my understanding that like early membranes had a really high reject rate and that that just the advancements over time, whether materials or efficiency in and in, in energy and that type of thing has allowed for improvements in that front i know that energy the energy side of the equation is always a consideration that people are talking about too um are there elements of that of that evolution that you want to touch on that kind of will help frame a lot of what we're of what else we're going to talk about today sure um i would say that one of those has been automation you know the industry over the last five years the big players the duponts the tories of the world have invested quite a bit in automation which allows them to make small incremental tweaks, improvements, but that ends up with more energy savings as they make the membrane just a little bit thinner and a little bit thinner. Um, you know, we can go from the 300 driving pressure to the 250 driving pressure to 100 now to even under 100. And I do think we're now getting close to the point where reverse osmosis, really high rejection membrane, could actually run on tap water pressure. We're not there yet. But as they continue to automate some of those developments and get the membrane that much thinner and some of the proprietary things they're doing, we're seeing that. So that's reducing the energy from the standpoint of how much pressure do we have to put on the membrane to push through the membrane? And then the other aspect, like I mentioned, is these creative ways to run membrane that reduce scale and following. And that lowers our total cost from cleaning, extends the life, um, fewer chemicals used, you know, our industry, just like many, are seeing a big push in ESG and that sustainability drive of our right, membranes. How are you going to use waste, less water? I mean, you always use water because that's the, the fundamental purpose. But how do you use you know, our waste, less water, give us more good water back and use less chemicals, use less energy at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and what I'm hearing from you now 
as well is that uh, it seems like the primary driver here is like how can we make this more affordable for utilities so that they're more willing to say yes um could you talk about some of the drivers there about like how why these advancements are starting to occur or sure, have been occurring sure. rather <laughs> yeah and I, I think you know as the uh, as the world becomes more and more aware of our environment and the water we're drinking um, obviously there's been a lot of press about PFAS and some of those other emerging contaminants um, membrane technology is one of the methods that often is looked at to help that. I mean, if we look at the, the city of Flint and the struggles that they went through with the contamination of lead, um, there are a number of ways to remove lead, but home RO is one of them. And so consumers are educating themselves. And then we look at, you know, more of the larger populations in the Middle East and the East and India and China, for example, the consumers, you know, that middle class is rising up. And as that middle class rises up, they have a better understanding and a better ability to treat their own water and take kind of control of themselves for their water quality. So huge demand for membrane technology in those two countries as consumers get a better understanding of look, where did this water come from? What is this water? Maybe those emerging contaminants are something I need to worry about. Um, and they just want that extra barrier between themselves and whatever their water source is a, because they can afford it, and B, they're just much more educated than they were in the past. In the past, you kind of turned on the tap and you're like, well, I don't really know where it came from, and I'm not sure what I should worry about is in the water. Uh, it's funny, you know, consumers look at water, in my experience, as if it's clear and it's cold, it's probably safe. But ironically, that's kind of the opposite. Dirty, warm water could be safer than cold, clear water because you actually don't see the things that hurt you in water. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not it's not all about the visual inspection or the smell no, it's inspection. Not. It's There's not. so much more going on. Um, <laughs> what so you you had mentioned kind of at the top here about uh, some of some of the applications about like water reuse becoming a bigger part of this uh, whole thing. Um, yeah. Could you talk about some of the applications that membranes are uh, that people could most benefit from when they want to use these membranes? Sure. Yeah, um, we're doing a lot of work, as I said, in um, kind of water reuse and water concentration. Um, some specific industries that I see that trend increasing. Um, certainly oil and gas, uh, as oil and gas development increases significantly in the U.S. Um, and all of us are probably paying a bit more attention now to the price of crude oil because we feel it at the gasoline pump. And so the ability to recycle, reuse more water in that produced water space, um, you know, right now on average in the U.S., you get about 10 barrels of water for every barrel of oil you bring up out of the ground. And the more efficiently that we can reuse that water for secondary purposes or clean it up so it can be safely discharged in the environment, that helps us develop more oil at lower cost and keep that gasoline price down until the renewables can all catch up. Um, other industries, pharmaceutical textile, uh, we're seeing quite a bit of use there on the back end of the plant with you know, a lot of different contaminants coming out, kind of you know, challenging wastewaters that in the past might have been trucked off site. Um, now those companies are looking at well, how do I recycle, reuse them, and then other big cons uh, consumer type companies. Um, you know, for example, our company uh, recently got an investment from Micron Technologies, the chip manufacturer, and it was interesting to hear their drivers. Um, they looked at our technology, our company, as hey, there's a way to save energy in our operations, which was actually driven by their customers. You know, their customers being Microsoft, Google people that are making data centers and they're being driven by consumers. You know, so this consumer awareness of, all right, how much water are you using Microsoft, Google? I mean, you say you have a zero water footprint. What does that really look like? And that's driving all the way back up into the supply chain with big users of water looking to their suppliers saying, look, you've got to help me. I've got to figure out how to recycle and squeeze more out of what we already have. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping costs measured. I, I mean, when you're talking about uh, silicon microchips and stuff like that as well. We all know the challenges of that right now and how exorbitant certain costs are. So yeah. I'm sure they're like, anything we can do to keep the price from inflating any higher is yep. going to be ideal. Yeah, for sure. Business. Yeah, and, and increasing capacity. It was interesting. Uh, Taiwan had a drought uh, about a year ago now, and it really affected a lot of the chip manufacturing that happens in Taiwan because there's only so much water to go around. And we as humans continue to you know, buy more and more things with microchips in it. You know, our coffee cup is supposed to have a microchip in it now. So we got to make them somewhere and to make them, you need a lot of water. And so, yeah, this, this driver from the consumer level all the way back up to those manufacturers and just the global footprint. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the reality we all live in products 
crisscross the world and one little chip, you know, prevents you from getting your fancy new car. Um, so we all have to figure out how to do it a little better. Yeah. And the water crisscrosses the world as well. Yep, <laughs> so, exactly. um, yeah. so how do you how do you see membrane technology changing, evolving and advancing in the next five years? You talked a little bit about how automation is starting to change things, trying to get things yep. thinner membranes and that type of thing. Where do you see, see things going? Yeah, I, I see kind of three different fronts there where development is accelerating. Uh, one is actually the membrane chemistry. So this gets okay. into that notion of that the layer that's actually doing the separation. You know, the industry started with a cellulose acetate polymer. Now we've largely gone on a polyamide. And now whether it's graphene or other newer composites or resins or polymers that people are playing around with, um, I think that's interesting. And then looking at combination, you know, a lot of studies are being done now with how do we put electricity or other things right at the membrane surface to change its characteristics, its energy use, its fouling resistance, things like that. Um, then you go to membrane construction, and that's really the heart of what we're doing at Aqua Membranes is how do we put together a membrane package that enables better performance? Um, how do we remove the energy waste? How do we increase its life, decrease its fouling tendencies? And then thirdly, stepping back further, how do we look at it as a system? Um, again, this is back into the running a membrane system differently, whether it's in a pulse flow or reverse flow, you know, some of those trends we're seeing. And then maybe a fourth one I just thought of is water as a service. Certainly we're seeing that trend as well. Um, manufacturers in the textile or automotive industries say, look, we're good at what we do. We know we need to recycle water more, but we don't wanna be water recycle experts because that's challenging. So we'll just pay you a monthly fee on the, the gallons you give us back. Um, and so we are seeing that trend accelerate which is actually requiring more capital to come into the industry because now they have to underwrite and hold those assets over time. Um, so that investment is coming more and more into the water space on the sustainability notion, kind of covering all four, the materials, the construction, the systems, and even the go-to-market strategy of, look, we're not going to sell capital now. Instead, we're going to own and operate the capital and charge you for that water reuse. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, the, the honestly, now that you say that, that water as a service, I've heard wastewater as a service too from a couple other folks, especially in that industrial space. Um, yep. That gives me some ideas. I'm, I might have to pick your brain about that later too. <laughs> so, sure, sure. But yeah, um, what are some what are uh, what are some of the biggest obstacles that you see for those advancements and whatnot? Are there are there headwinds that are kind of making that a challenge right now? And what are you looking to do to try and overcome those headwinds? Sure. Yeah, I think there's two big obstacles. Um, one is regulatory, one is cost. Uh, one of my old bosses always used to have a, a saying about wastewater is everybody has a wastewater problem because they have wastewater. You know, nobody wants wastewater. They wish they didn't have it. But the reality is, as we make things, we create waste streams that have to be treated. Um, and for a long time, it was always this measure of, all right, well, what's the best alternative to treating the wastewater or reusing it? And it was usually just buy new wastewater and then have Bobby haul away the bad stuff in a truck and who knows where it goes. Um, and so the good news is with kind of more environmental responsibility and stewardship, both at the consumer level and certainly at the corporate level, it's starting to catch up. Uh, we're seeing that that's not the only measure. You know, the, the measure used to be, all right, is it is it cheaper to treat the wastewater or cheaper to buy new water? And especially in the United States, water is really cheap still. Um, and so that that wasn't the right metric. So we're seeing that start to change, uh, which I think is a huge positive for everybody, both industry, consumers, and the environment, because now people are looking at, all right, it's more expensive to reuse the water, but it's the right thing to do in their secondary benefits. Um, and we're even seeing some investors, uh, you know, investors getting involved with, you know, Exxon Mobil kind of had a, a famous, uh, proxy vote that very surprised that surprised them greatly when you know a small group of investors were able to actually change their board makeup because they didn't feel like they were being good stewards um, being responsible as far as the environment and things like that so investors are pushing it consumers are pushing it and corporations are paying attention um, yeah. and then i think the second one is regulatory again as the world understands more and more um, you know what is in the water how to treat the water you know, that's becoming important. Uh, India has an interesting situation right now with home reverse osmosis. So this idea of taking a, a, an RO system, putting it in your house and making your water better, there was some concern there that people were maybe using that that didn't need it and just using it kind of for, you know, um, 
benefit of the water tastes better, but it doesn't really make it safer. And they were worried about more salt going back out into the waste stream because people were using home RO. So I found that interesting that even they're looking all the way down to the consumer level and thinking about regulation levels of, all right, how do we manage the salt level that goes out in the system and comes back? And you know maybe that's something we want to be careful of because eventually the salt has to be treated or put somewhere. Um, you know, there's no free lunch. If the contaminants come into the building or come into the house, they either have to go out of the house or get all the way to ZLD, which is another trend that's increasing because as we put more things into that recycling water, eventually they have to come out. Mm -hmm. And really the only way effectively to take them out is to boil them off, make them a solid, and then, you know, put them in storage or, you know, a sanitary landfill or something like that. Um, so ZLD, you know, evaporation is a trend we're also seeing. Yeah. The final barrier element there, like the point of use, point of entry, uh, reverse osmosis thing is very interesting to me. I think that, 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 you know, I hadn't even considered the idea. It's just like, oh, yeah, of course, municipalities deal with this, too. But as soon yep. as it gets down to the consumer level, now they're dealing with this waste as well. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And they're deciding, you know, and it's really interesting because right now you go on Amazon and you could spend you know, $200 for a home reverse osmosis system or $2,000. Yeah. And you really don't have a great idea as a consumer of, well, they all make really big claims and you know they make different water efficiency numbers and you know recommendations but you really almost have to be a membrane expert to really dive down into the operating and say all right is this one really a more responsible buy because of the water it wastes versus this one or do i just buy on cost which most consumers you know tend to do on lots of things they buy yeah Wow, we, we could probably go on for a lot longer here. Yeah. <laughs> I would love and I'd love to reconnect with you on some other things. Again, the water sure. as a service, wastewater as a service would be a great conversation for us to have down the line. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for everyone who's watching, we'll make sure to have some some links in the video description below so you can see a little bit more about what Aqua Membranes is doing and learn a little bit more about membranes from our website as well. So um but yeah, thanks again, Greg. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today. I've learned a Yeah, it was a great job, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Thanks so much.